Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, we are the podcast that brings you a wide variety of guests that speak to a diverse set of topics. Uh, Hopefully, we'll uncover something that may help you be more successful in your business, or if you have something that's keeping you up at night, we can provide you a solution. So today, we are... uh, uh, we are happy to have Allison Verhalen. She is with AV Riding Services as our guest. She majored in English and psychology, little knowing she was getting the perfect degree for content marketing. When she was offered a chance to write blog posts for a friend's law firm, she jumped at the chance to make money with her writing. Not only has she not looked back, she's improved her online marketing and SEO skills while gaining experience writing for various industries. Allison, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. We certainly do appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, if we get through the get through the introduction there, we got it's all going to be <laughs> it's going to be all downhill from here. So, before we jump into this, is something I'm I am so interested in because I'm a non-writer writer. I love to write, but uh, I mean my skills are in spreadsheets and and more math functions, and so it's it's a challenge, but. Before we get into that, tell us a little bit more about your history. Um, so what was your original path that you wanted to, where did you think you wanted to go? And then what really excited you about writing enough to, you know, make you stick around and make a career out of it? Well, I've always loved writing. I've been writing short stories since I learned my alphabet oh. and always, always wanted to be a professional writer. I was always told growing up that writers don't make any money and I <laughs> needed to get a realistic career. Right. Um, but I ended up majoring in English because I just couldn't stay away from it. And um, there's always something you can do with an English major. Yeah. Um, Also got sucked into psychology, which really surprised me. Um, I took an AP psych class in high school and loved it and took another class in college and loved that. And so I ended up double majoring. Um, So I graduated thinking I was going to go into publishing, thinking, okay, well, if I can't be a professional writer, maybe I can be an editor or, or something to do with writing in books. I graduated college in 2009, right after the job market crashed. So there were no jobs to be had in publishing or really anywhere else. So, uh, you know, I was in customer service. I was a receptionist. They were jobs. They were not careers. Um, And as you said, I found myself between jobs at one point. And my roommate at the time, her dad, uh, who was an attorney, was awesome and offered to give me stuff to do around his office until I got back on my feet. And one of the things he needed was someone to write blog posts for his law firm. So I took over writing for him and then for an associate of his and then for some friends of mine. I did eventually get another day job, but I kept writing on the side. And the writing kept going, growing to the point where I couldn't really do both anymore. Yeah. So quit the day job about six and a half years ago now wow. and have been doing this full time ever since. Yeah, that's an awesome story. And I, I, I don't think that um, a lot of people don't understand the value of writing for a lot of reasons. I mean, even personally, we could talk about journaling. That's something that I've picked up of late that I really try to do to get thoughts down. But then also in our business, because it's not, you know, blogs are important, I think. But think about emails, our conversations, our email marketing. You know, we have to have a plan behind that and not just uh, loosely throw some words out there that might make a sentence and, and send out because not only is it the message that we're trying to motivate somebody but also i think we're probably judged a little bit on our on our grammar and you know being from texas english is my second language so uh you know that's something i have to really watch for is the the, the uh, grammatical and the you know turn of phrases and things like that yeah, and the the strategy, I think, is something that people really fall behind on when they're trying to do their own content marketing is they know they need to be emailing, they know they need to be doing blogging and social media, but they don't really think about what happens next. Yeah. What do you want the person to do after they've seen your social media post or your email or read your whole blog post? Right. So that's another area where I help my clients and help figure out, okay, what does this client journey look like? Where are they going after this? Yeah. Now, strategy is so important because um, with with writing and what we can do with that, it's um, we really need to sit down and have a strategy, I think, for a couple reasons. I, and I'll throw this out to get your comment on that. But uh, it's not a short term. Uh, it's not a short term fix or not a short term 
uh, proposition, basically, you know, uh, we may get lucky and we may hit something off that first email we send out, but typically, you know, it takes time. And uh, so anyway, I think that gets back to why we need to develop a strategy that cuts across all different forms of media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you need a strategy that, like I said, gets people in the, the door and then converts them so that yeah. you're actually getting them to engage with you. And like you said, it's not, I always say it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's, it's a long term strategy. Right. You need a lot of blog posts and a lot of emails because you're building that trust is what it really comes down to. You have to build trust with Google. Google is not going to start sending traffic your way immediately. <laughs> right. You have to build trust with your readers. Yeah. So it, it that's everything that goes into your 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 strategy is building that trust and yeah, yeah that's not going to happen for night. Yeah, and there was a, you know, we were talking to a friend of ours that has a uh, more of a uh, fashion type business, and she started out blogging, and that's where she grew it, but she said it was probably well over two years, and, you know, I don't know exactly how much she was doing. It just more the point is we need to have a strategy because we can, a lot of times we jump in and say, hey, I'm going to start writing, you know, we write three or four pieces, put them up in a couple of weeks, and then after two weeks, it's like, phone's not ringing so that must not be the thing that we need to do whereas like you say i mean it just takes a while for google to start looking at it but then also uh, you can kind of speak to the fact of the word counts because i think sometimes people uh, people kind of short themselves on what they write so it doesn't get a lot of exposure as well yeah so i do want to talk about word count because i do get that question a lot yeah. is how long should my blog post be um i always say at a minimum 500 words and consistency is a big one too so if you can write at least once a month i recommend that preferably more often but i know as small business owners we're often crunched for time so yeah. if you can only do 500 words a month that's the bare minimum but the average post showing up on the first page of Google these days is closer to 1,700 words, okay. which is like three and a half pages if you're writing it up in a in a Word document, yeah. single spaced. So that's a lot of content. But we find these pe these pieces of content that are these really long, really in depth how to guides that are like the ultimate guide on such and such. Oh. That is what gets the the. The searches in Google that shows up on the first page, and that's what people tend to engage with when they see that you are answering every question that they have on a particular topic. Right. They are much more likely to not only engage with the content, but spend more time yeah. engaging with the content. And then again, they're going to be more likely to convert into a customer at the end. Yeah, the other thing is because um, some people think, ooh, 1,700 words, that's a lot. But what I think another part I'd like for you to talk to is about repurposing some of that longer form content, you know, into other platforms. Yeah. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, right? You've got the emails, you've got the blog, you've got the social media, there are the podcasts, yeah. there are all these kinds of content you're supposed to be creating and it is really overwhelming. So I always recommend that people repurpose as much as they can. If you have 1700 words of content, take advantage of all of those 1700 words, put them out in your emails, put it out on social media. Again, people don't tend to have a strategy when it comes to social media, they put yeah. stuff out on social media. And it's like, okay, are you driving people back to your website? Or are you just posting and, and hoping they'll find you after that? Right, right. So um, I always think blog posts are a great way to provide something of value on social media that also gets people back to your website. Yeah. So yeah, having all that great content is a great way to, um, it gives you something to repurpose. It gives you a lot to work with on all of those different platforms. Yeah. And one thing I just thought of while you were talking, you know, is, uh, if you're doing the how to, like you said, and you're answering people's questions, uh, another conversion is not necessarily writing, but we can take our writing and make it into quick, um, how to videos, because again, it's, you know, we, I, I think part of our strategy is, you know, we have places we know our audience lives and we hit that a little bit more, but we really can't ignore every place. And so we try to, you know, break it up and have a little bit of nuggets that go out across a wide variety of channels. So uh, it's, it's a tough question to ask, and I don't mean to put you on the spot because I know it depends on 
if your service, if your product, who your audience is, but you know, how do you typically handle strategy across all of these multiple channels as far as maybe, you know, number of posts, uh, things like that? Yeah, again, it all comes back to repurposing your content. And I like to remind people that if they are making videos and they should be making videos, that that's great because yes, people do engage with videos. Mm -hmm. Google cannot yet read uh, vis visual content or audio content. Uh, they are working on it. I am sure they will get there soon. <laughs> right, um, right. But for right now, it, it really is all about the text. Yeah. So you need that, that written text in order to show up in Google. That being said, Google also owns YouTube. So if you really optimize your video headlines and your descriptions in YouTube, that gives you a pretty good chance of showing up in online searches. And again, like you said, it depends on what you're providing. If you're doing a high how to tutorial, uh, that's very, it relies on video and you're, you're showing someone how to do something that can show up on the first page of Google, because again, Google owns YouTube. So, but yeah, as far as repurposing, I always recommend if you're already making a video and it's not super reliant on the visual, you can have the video, you can take the audio from that video, turn it into a podcast like this. Um, and then you can transcribe that content the audio content into a blog post yeah so you you created one thing but you can spread it across three different channels without spending all that time creating three different pieces of content yeah so um uh, i'll tell you what my list i have to turn page turn the page on my list here i've got <laughs> some of you down let's start at the top um because um headlines usually uh, is is that the one the i guess rank high in what google looks at first i know they scan the entire document but how do headlines play into us getting eyes on our writing yes headlines are one of those things that google looks at first if you have 1700 words of content or longer i know some people write 2000 3000 word long blog posts that's a lot of content and it does take google a while to go through it so yes google will look at your headline first it will look at your subheadings first or second. Um, so always use those subheadings, A, for SEO reasons, but also if you're writing thousands of words, it helps to break up that content. Yeah. So it's easier for people to skim and, and to read and to find what they're looking for. So um, yeah, and then alt tags on your images. Um, again, Google can't read images yet, but you can have a little alt tag there that um, inserts a keyword there and Google will read that first. Those are all uh, what we call meta tags. Okay. So you can put those in throughout your content and Google kinds of kind of scans those first before it looks at the rest of your content. So yeah, you absolutely wanna make sure that your target keyword for that particular piece is throughout all of those meta tags. Okay. Yeah, so on the, the alt tags for the pictures, do you have suggestions on what we should be putting there? Because uh, I've heard both, like sometimes I use the actual uh, headline again there with the name of the show after it. But I've also heard that you can just describe what you see in the picture with your keywords in it. Is there a preference on that? Yeah, I would not use the same thing over and over, the same description or the same alt tag, just because then you, you're kind of fighting with yourself to rank for that particular keyword. Okay. So I would recommend having a different keyword for each image. Obviously it all has to be related right. to what it is you're providing um, and the, the search terms you wanna show up for with that particular piece of content. Mm -hmm. But yeah, make sure you have a good keyword in there. Okay. So let's talk about selection of pictures. I mean, I have some very definite uh, opinions that I've made on this show pr about that, but about picture selection, but I'll let you talk about that. Images are important, and a couple reasons that I know about is just because we're visual. I would rather look at a picture than anything else. But also, when we start looking at uh, social media, especially like uh, Twitter and a, a, a uh, Facebook, it's the real estate. You know, if we write four sentences or five sentences, you take up you know an inch or so. But if you got a picture that all of a sudden, you know, doubles, triples, quadruples the real estate and that the picture usually catches people's attention, then they read. Yeah, absolutely. It's very eye catching. Like yeah. you said, we are primed to engage with visual content. Yeah. So 
yeah, if people see, even if you have a whole bunch of text on something and it is like a big long post, first of all, you're going to have that little show more tag. So it's yeah. not necessarily all going to show up right away. Um, but yeah, people are, a lot of people tend to see a big block of text. Even readers like me will mm -hmm. look at it and be kind of intimidated by it and be like, oh, that's a lot of text. I don't know if I have time to read all of this. But yeah, you break it up with some images and it makes it much more engaging so i would say make sure they are high quality images try avoid using stock images try you know hiring a graphic designer yeah. or learning graphic design yourself so you can get high quality images in there you can also use images and i do this a lot because in my blog post because i talk about seo and sometimes it gets a little technical so you can use charts and graphs to demonstrate what it is you're talking about so if you've got a bunch of data and numbers and stuff that people can get bogged down in if you can present that in a visual format that's yeah. going to be much more engaging so it's not just that you need good images it's that you need good images that help people engage with the content you're yeah. writing yeah yeah, and that's kind of one of my th things I stand on quite a bit is that, uh, you know, if there are times we have to use stock images. We don't, there's no way around it. But if we can use a personal, personalized picture, something that we took, if it relates to what we're writing about, it seems to resonate much better with the audience because what I find is people are, uh, they can relate to this picture, which makes them relate to you and to the story that you're writing because like, oh, you know, we used to go to a lake or, you know, whatever it may be that, or, oh, we're dog lovers. So, you know, it's like when we see a picture with the dog in it, of course, we're drawn to that. Absolutely. Yeah. And people do love looking at pictures of uh, other people's faces. So yeah. it, it might be kind of scary to put your face <laughs> out there, but yeah. that's what people want to see because, like you said, it makes you relatable, especially in this digital era where we are increasingly digital. People yeah. want that proof that there's a real life person behind this website and showing a picture of yourself or even a video is the best way to do that. Yeah. So let's jump down to the bottom of the page for just a minute. Hashtags, uh, you know, a lot. <laughs> And I'm confused about that. Used to more was better than I've read some stuff of late where, uh, you know, it's even stranger that each different platform maybe has some of its own guidelines for how many to use. What can you help us with on that? Yeah, I I think the general rule I've seen is that like two is best. Um, and I think I initially saw that on Twitter and then I've kind of seen that rule on other social media platforms yeah. as well. So that's kind of the rule that I stick to is no more than two. Someone once put it really succinctly, I think, which is they said that if you're, you know, if you've got two hashtags, you're talking to people. If you've got more than that, if you've got, if you're trying to max out at those like 30 hashtags, you're not talking to people anymore. You're talking to an algorithm. Yeah, right. And while we do have to work with the algorithm, it's important to remember that at the end of the day, there's a specific audience you're trying to reach. Yeah. So yeah. what hashtags are they following? What search terms are they using? Focus on that. And yeah. that's where you're going to find the gold mine. Yeah, because I've seen uh, Instagram, it seems to be the place it happens is there's three lines of text and 24 lines of hashtags that follow below. <laughs> like, yeah, I've seen that too. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the middle um, because, you know, as we write, we, we want to keep the keywords and the SEO in line. But again, I will ask you this at the very basics, if we write a good piece about what we are, you know, what we're writing about, and we do a good job at that, it's pretty much going to be optimized in itself. Is that correct? Yeah, you have to answer people's questions and provide value and do that consistently. Yeah. So, yes, there's always tweaking you can do around the length and the subheadings and the meta tags and the keywords, but at its most basic level, content marketing is all about creating that rich content that answers people's questions. Google is just getting better and better at matching people with the content they're looking for. Yeah. So if you always keep your customer in mind and not try to think too much about Google, yeah. again, we do have to play by Google's rules, but keep in mind that Google is not your customer. That's right. not the person you're ultimately trying to reach. What does your customer want to know about? Yeah. If you can provide that, Google will find a way to pair you with those people. Yeah. 
which kind of leads to the keyword stuffing. That's what I'd written down is that, you know, we have to be careful back in the old days, you know, there were all kinds of tips and tricks. You could um, make the words fade into the background and you could have, you know, like a whole uh, another written page that was all white on the background. But nowadays, you know, they will actually, I guess they'll take, you know, we call it jokingly Google jail that they'll put you in, but they you know they're actually uh, block your website from any of the search results. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. So for, I don't know how much your, your listeners know about this, but keyword stuffing is when you have one keyword that you cram in as many times as you can into a page or a paragraph. So if we want to talk about content marketing and I can tell you how I can help you with content marketing because content marketing is awesome and you need content marketing, <laughs> that's an example of keyword stuffing that, yeah, it did work for a short period of time as far as showing up for that particular keyword. And then Google caught wise to it. And yeah. now, yeah, like you said, they'll actually blacklist you for it. So you you won't show up in any yeah. searches on Google. So, yeah, and it's just not good content. I mean, yeah. again, always keep in mind, you want real people reading your content and yeah. you want to convert them. So showing up in searches is just the first step. Then you have to get them to engage with your content and then convert them into a customer. So yeah. always keep in mind what kind of content will accomplish that. Yeah, because I've heard, you know, when when it was explained to me this way about Google is, you know, they want to provide the optimal experience to their clients, to their readers. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of gets back to the, 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 what you were just talking about, about the content marketing stuffing. That's not going to be very pleasurable to read and probably not, nobody's going to really get much out of reading that. So uh, it's a good thing. You know, sometimes people look at it as a bad thing, but really what's the use of washing up to uh, a high search return with something that's just really garbage that nobody could read anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. That brings up something, a good point that uh, I have pondered more lately than I ever thought I would. But if, how do, how do we structure that keyword our key phrases that we want to work around? Because what I've, uh, what I've heard lately is that when you try to structure it to, a keyword that's got a lot of uh, a bunch of traffic and a lot of high big money chasing it it can be very difficult for a smaller company to really rank for that so sometimes it's almost better to look down the list at some you know and I don't know how far you go but can you talk about that just a little bit yeah so I always look for the content gaps when I'm doing my keyword research which means you want something that's getting a decent search volume, which sometimes you hit gold and, and you do find those keywords that are getting tens of thousands of searches a month, but don't already have a ton of competition. And if you're using any keyword research tool, even the free ones, they're going to show you the monthly search volume. That number is the average monthly search volume. And then it's going to show you the SEO competition score, which is a score from one to 100. And that gives you an idea of the competition out there. What are your chances of actually showing up for this particular keyword? So one is super easy. There's no other content out there. You're golden. 100 is there's a ton of content out there. Don't even bother. Yeah. I tend to aim for like 20 to 30 as my SEO competition score, which gives me like a 70 to 80 percent chance of showing up in uh, on the first page of Google for that yeah. particular keyword. So yeah, sometimes you got to go for those keywords with a little bit lower search volume in yeah. order to get that sweet spot for the SEO competition score. And yeah, it's all about playing around and finding about where where is the sweetest spot, where yeah. you, can you get the most searches for the least amount of competition. Um, and one of the ways to do that is those long tail keywords. So a short tail keyword is one to two words. Long tail keyword is three to five words. Mm. Those are the ones that tend to have, again, a lower search volume, but also lower competition score. And the big value of those, I think, is the fact that people tend to be looking for something specific. If they're looking for, I'm going to use myself as an yeah. example again, content marketing is a huge keyword that a lot of people use. It's really hard to rank for. If I talk about a content marketing company providing, you know, serving small businesses in Chicago, that's someone is looking for something very specific when they're searching for that. So right. when they find me, they're much more likely to click on my website to engage with my content and become a customer. Yeah. yeah and and uh, also we can talk about the, the, again, the volume, the, the number of pages that we have out there. I think, 
you know, as we build that content, it's always much better to have more than less quality. You know, we don't want to mm-hmm. just uh, put a lot, a, quant- a large quantity of junk out there. But if we do a high quality, a high quantity of high quality, then we have some, you know, we start to have something for everyone because everybody, even if we have, even if we're looking at content marketing, um, I may have some different, uh, you know, like I may search for blog writer or something, you know, kind of a little bit different. So the more pieces we get out there that cover more ground, we generally are just automatically start to attract more viewers. And you can look, I look at it this way, instead of having one page and a hundred viewers, you can have, a, you know, a hundred pages now with one viewer. And then that way your numbers can usually tend to grow, Correct. Correct. Yeah, because you've got all that juicy content and Google gets the more content you have, the more Google gets an idea of what you're all about, which helps Google pair you with the right search terms. So, yeah. And I always advocate for quality and consistency over quantity. Mm -hmm. Quantity does matter, but I would say quality and consistency first and then worry about the quantity. Yeah. Yeah, And a good recommendation, uh, like you said earlier, I guess, you know, if you could write quality every day, of course, that's more desirable. But if if you're in a business and you've got to take care of your daily stuff, if you get one quality longer, uh, work, higher word count piece out a month, that's a great starting point. As you get used to doing that, you can always up it to twice a month and then grow from there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's going to be better at engaging and converting the people who do find those blog posts because if you try to create content every day or every week and it's just not sustainable for you you're not going to get results from that so yeah focus on quality first you you mentioned um earlier the uh, the little dotted read more line yeah i've always been curious uh, because i use those because you know the transcripts from these uh podcasts can be quite lengthy so it's that are taking up a lot of real estate, but I just wonder, do they affect Google's ability to scan that text for that page? It, okay. Not at all. Google sees everything. Google knows all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Google is even reading stuff. You can put stuff on the back end of your your website, stuff that the viewers don't see. Google will go in and see that. Like the alt tags for those images, that's something that does not the viewer never gets to see that, um, but Google will see it. So that's a way of saying, Google, hey, this is what's here in this block that you can't really see right now. Yeah. So let's talk about those, uh, what do you call them, the the subtitles? It's like you have the, the title at the top, and then you're supposed to break your text up and put like a subtitle. Uh, how many words? Yeah. Uh, how How should we use those? Because I've heard that they're very important and you just confirmed that. But, you know, somebody like myself, I'll be honest and say, you're, you know, until a few years ago, I never used them. I just didn't understand the value and then just write a straight piece of paper. But talk about them for just a minute. Yeah, it is really a, a way of breaking up your content into different sections. So I, I think the most concrete example I can give is if you have, you know, three ways to do such and such, you've got three tips that you're providing. So you have tip, you've got the, your little intro right after the main headline. And then you've got tip number one is your first heading. And then you're going to talk about that tip in more depth in yeah. the two or three paragraphs following and same with the tip two, tip three, however many tips you end up providing. Okay. Uh, infographics of and you kind of were talking about that we didn't call it by name but you know talking about if you have a lot of number stats you know graphically format but I've heard that those things uh, perform usually very well they do perform very well that's another way that people again they're very visual we are primed to engage with visual content so they're very eye-catching and for people who look at you know a multi thousand word blog post and and figure that's too much content for them to read they are if you can condense that content into an infographic people are much more likely to look at that and see what they need um and right now the big thing is interactive infographics so if you can get little animated stuff in there that's really (laughs) eye-catching if you can get a link in there or multiple links so you can have like a an infographic where each little 
thing provides a link to a subheading in your blog post so they can click on it and go straight to the part of the blog post that really interests them. Yeah. You know, if you have lots of words on a particular subject, maybe they don't want to read the whole blog post. They just want an answer to this particular question by providing an interactive visual format that they can navigate and find their way to just the answer they need. It's going to be, make it much more likely that they interact with that content. Yeah. Which you bring up links and, uh, you know, talk about this in kind of multifaceted points. Number one, um, our content, let's just take a blog, for instance, our blogs, usually they want, um, uh, was it one internal link to something that's in our site and then an external link or more, uh, going out. But then we also have what they call the backlinks. And I'll let you talk a little bit about both of those and the importance of them. Yeah, so there are internal and external backlinks. And internal backlinks are, like you said, when you link back to another piece of content in your own website from something else on your website, that's an internal backlink. An external backlink is when another website links back to your website. And Google kind of figures that like hangs out with like. So if you have high quality websites with great content that are ranking for certain keywords and they're linking back to your website, that's really good for you. Google yeah. is going to like that. That helps establish you as an authority in your industry. That helps boost your rankings. If not so great websites are linking back to your website, <laughs> yeah. again, Google figures like hangs out with like, and it's going to discount you for that. You're, you're going to be punished for it, which I know is not fair that you're getting punished for what other people do online. There are backlink trackers and analyzers and ways to mitigate that. Yeah. So you can use these online tools, not to delete the link because you don't have that power because it's on their website, unless you delete your content that they linked back to. Yeah. But you can tell Google, hey, no, I don't associate with this website. Please don't follow this link back yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah because, uh, you know, there and they may still go on. There was a time they had what they call backlink farms and you know, I'd create a website and all I did was charge people $100 to put their website link on mine. And it, it uh, I mean, in, in, uh, I guess in theory, it makes sense. But the other part you have to think about is that domain authority. And I'll let you talk a little bit about that. But if you get a backlink from a domain authority, it's equal to or lesser than you, really not going to help you that much. And so I, I, it's just a word of caution that when people reach out to you and say, hey, I can get you this backlink for, you know, 50 bucks. I always kind of uh, grimace at that because it takes a lot of work to get a decent, good backlink. You don't just you can't acquire them. And it's very hard if you try to do it organically as well. Yeah, I would say don't ever buy backlinks. Um, Google does not like it. Admittedly, it is kind of hard for Google to figure out um, what's a bought backlink, backlink and what's not. But again, Google knows all and they do have their ways of figuring these things out. So just don't risk it. Yeah. Make sure that they, they are a quality website. You mentioned domain authority, which has gotten a lot of talk lately. It's actually something that Moz made up as yeah. uh, a tool that they offer where you can in theory, track your, your domain authority, which is supposed to be how well Google likes you. Um, but Google doesn't talk to Moz about like how their algorithm works. So Moz has their own algorithm to figure out domain authority, which is hmm. not necessarily the same as Google's algorithm. So, and I know there are other SEO tools that are, again, they're saying they provide domain authority. It, it's more tricky than that. Yeah. So take it with a grain of salt. But I think if you're if someone links back to your website and you get that little alert, just take some time to look through their website. Make sure it's relevant. Make sure they've got good content. Make sure that the content in which they've linked back to your website, it actually makes sense that they linked back to you. It has something to do with what you're talking about yeah. in your content. If it seems completely unrelated and it's really badly written and there are no graphics or terrible graphics, then you want to manage that backlink. Yeah, and I would say that echo that message across all social medias because, you know, years ago I almost learned the hard way that, um, you know, a guy told me he could really increase my Facebook traffic, I think. So I'm like, okay, well, he did. 
but they were unfortunately from another country that weren't buyers of my product. And so luckily I, you know, I told him, you show me what you can do and then we'll talk about how much this is going to cost me. Well, yeah, I had a flurry of activity, but they were not buyers. And I think it's an important part to uh, an important point to stress is that, and I kind of use it jokingly and said that, you know, we went out to eat at our local Mexican restaurant last weekend. And uh, when she brought the bill, I pulled out all my likes from Facebook and she wouldn't take them. You know, she still wants cash. And so unless they are quality people who are our customers that will lead to them being a buyer, it's totally useless. It's more of a vanity metric. Yeah, and I think that's all gets back to what we were saying at the beginning about how this is a long term strategy. Right. If there really is no get rich quick scheme, whether it's, you know, buying those backlinks or buying views on social media is um, you, you really have to put in the work in yeah. order to earn Google's trust and again, earn your audience's trust. Yeah, there's just really no shortcut. So if anybody yeah. approaches you with a uh, shortcut, <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. always be <laughs> leery, always be leery. Well, I know we're running a little bit long, but a couple things I wanted to touch on before we get out of here are uh, newsletters and, of course, emails again. One of my strategies in email marketing was to, um, what I would do is I, I had Google alerts for a lot of different things. And so whenever an article would come across that I felt like resonated with one or more of my clients, what I would do is kind of deconstruct that and say, look, found this article, give them a hot link to it. Here are three points that I got out of it that I think will really help you and send it to them. I think, um, because I don't like, uh, and this is a personal thing. I don't like getting an email saying, Hey Roy, we talked last week and, uh, are you ready to buy you? <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and I think we also have to think about how many touches does it usually take? Now I think smaller dollar items and services, don't take much thought. I buy a five or ten dollar thing on an impulse. When we start talking about five, ten, twenty thousand dollar items, I'm gonna have to give that a lot more thought. You're gonna have to reach out and touch me a lot more during that buying process. So, how how can we handle that tactfully? Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of questions in there. So let me see <laughs> if I can remember everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, it, it does take a lot of touches, especially for me, I'm in a B2B industry. So people need to make sure that they're really gonna get a return on their investment with me. Yeah. A lot of my clients that I work with, like I said, I've started working with an attorney. I have since worked with other attorneys and coaches and financial planners. And those are all people who uh, their, their clients are really gonna think for a while before they decide to go ahead and buy and make that investment. So you, again, long-term strategy, yeah. uh, again, you can, if you have lower cost items, like you said, you can put up an ad on Facebook or Instagram or wherever your audience is hanging out and they're more likely to go for that, that impulse buy. Yeah. But if you're in professional services and or B2B industry, yeah, it, it's going to take a little bit yeah. longer. And I love what you did with your email because you're providing value to them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, but it is a way to get in front of them and to remind them that a remind them you're still around yeah. and b remind them that you're an authority on the subject yeah. by demonstrating that in everything that you provided for them. So I think that's a really good strategy. Yeah, because I I, I like the education component because uh, maybe you maybe you're a, a user of my product or service. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need it right at this moment. Maybe you're perfectly happy with the person. Maybe you don't have the money for it. A lot of reasons that we just don't know. But I, I think it's important to stay in front of prospects that haven't bought from us because we never know when the moment is that they're going to be ready to commit. And I think this, again, it kind of winds us back to this long-term strategy that if we are consistent in our messaging and getting it out there, it's not like I sent you a message, you know, six months ago, now you're ready to buy and you don't even remember who I am or can't remember that last email. But if I've just been dripping on you along over this last six months, you're like, hey, I, I know I got it somewhere in here in my email. I know this guy's been sending. Maybe I'll take a look at that. Yeah, exactly. So what about newsletters? Um, how often, how much stuff? I know there used to be a lot of talk about structure, about you know, kind of breaking it up and not just being totally all business. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, um, I, again, I would say no less than once per month, because if you get less than that, people are going to forget who you are and they're yeah. going to they're going to think they never signed up for that newsletter because they don't remember signing up for it. Right. So at least once a month, um, no more than once a week. I think most of the newsletters I follow send me something once a week. Some of them, I think, send me the same thing twice, which probably means I messed up and, and gave them multiple email addresses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think most of the ones that I follow send me something once a week, which is good because I, again, I know who they are. It reminds me that they're still around and what they're doing, but it's not inundating my inbox yeah. with their newsletters. So that is, as far as timing, that's what I recommend as far as frequency. Uh, timing is something you want to play around with. Again, it's going to depend on your industry, on your target audience. When are they answering your emails? Um, when are they more likely to be checking their email and engaging with your newsletters? So take a look at that. See when people are opening your emails. If they're opening them after you, you know, hours or days after you send them, you might yeah. want to switch around when you send them out to get a better open rate. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another good place to remember that it's a, it's a long-term strategy that we don't, um, if we um, if we buy a list and we upload them and we send it out and a lot of people uh, unsubscribe or cancel or whatever they do at that point, that uh, the, uh, I guess the big newsletter companies, they will act, act, I guess they will deactivate you from using because that's a score for them. They don't want to be the name at the bottom of the page. That's keep spamming people. So again, we grow them organically and they need to be people that we've had some interaction with the prospect, the customer, you know, something like that. Yeah, and they have to either opt in or uh, confirm that they want your newsletter. Okay. So I think I've had one or two people on my newsletter where I manually put in their email address because they asked me to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I never just like input a whole bunch of emails right. or buy emails because, yeah. yeah, like you said, that's that's going to backfire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about days to release? Used to Tuesdays, that was the day everybody pushed everything out. But now I just wonder, is everybody pushing everything out on Tuesday? Is there, uh, you know, a better day to put our blogs out there? Yeah, I think the data I've seen is Tuesday is probably still the best day. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are like the top three. Yeah. Um, again, if you're providing something in like the professional services or B2B industry, if you're selling something more, that's, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> if yeah. you're selling something that's more B2B, um, a little less expensive, you can get away with sending stuff on the weekends when people are more likely to be shopping. Yeah. Um, but again, know which email it's going to. If it's going to their business email address and they're only checking it Monday through Friday, then make sure it goes out Monday through Friday. Yeah. And take a look at when people are looking at your email and, and when they're opening your email address yeah. or your, your newsletter that you send out yeah. uh, so that... I think I played around with that for a while because I used to send mine out on Tuesdays and I was realizing most people opened it on Wednesdays. Yeah. So I switched it to Wednesday and I get a higher open rate now. So there are always the general rules, but yeah. your audience might be a little different. So always check your own data and do some A-B testing. Yeah, and that's kind of been the the pattern with this podcast is, you know, played around with releasing through the week weekends. Uh, you know, the traffic goes way, way down just because everybody's out doing fun stuff. And the other thing you can tell uh, summer versus winter, it's like you get a lot more traction in the winter months when people are sometimes have to stay indoors when everybody's outdoors in the summer. So you have to look at all that. You can't get discouraged if you have a bad week because, you know, holiday weekends when everybody's out of the office, you know, just going to uh, be have less people there to read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, Allison. We're going to wrap this up. Um, so what what is a tool? Well, first, before we do that, any other tips that you want to put out there for uh, people writing? Yeah, you mentioned the free the when to post the blog post. Uh, the one thing is, again, like the newsletters, it tends to be best on Tuesdays or, you know, if you can't do Tuesday for whatever reason, Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday are like the three best days. Yeah. Again, do some A-B testing, play around with it, see what works for you. Okay. And also the more you can drive traffic to your blog post the day it goes up, the better it will perform because that organic traffic kind of 
shows Google that there is value in this, that people are interested in this content. Oh, interesting. So that can help improve your rankings as well. So if you can get it up and then get a newsletter out that same day and start pushing it out on social media that same day, yeah. that's going to help you out a little bit. Yeah, definitely. We didn't talk about that a lot, but definitely if we put a blog post or a podcast or anything out, we need to really, you know, follow up on social media, put some words out about it, let people know. We have loyal followers for sure, but we always want to grow that audience so we could find some new eyes out there. But, all yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate it. So what is a habit that you use in your daily life that uh, professional or personal, just something that you couldn't do without? Just the writing is something I could not do without. The, there's a reason I chose it as my profession or the reason it chose me, I think, <laughs> is just it's, it's something that I do every day, even if it's only for a little bit. Yeah. If writing, to, if you don't have time to sit down and write 2,000 words, then sit down and research some keywords. And then the next day, write an outline. And the next day, do a little bit of research. It doesn't have to be a two-hour chunk. Um, which is one of the things I've learned most recently, I think, is that I'm actually more productive in those smaller chunks of yeah. time rather than the huge chunks of time. So take advantage yeah. of that. Yeah. You know, as a non-writer writer, writer uh, I got into that as well. I thought I had to sit down and just write this whole thing out and I would get very discouraged. But I think I've learned to do, like you said, the outline, let it set, get back and do the right. And if you can structure this in the beginning and get on a path, but then also, once it's written, I let it sit there for a day or two because I, I tend to find changes I need to make or other things I would like to add. So, you know, don't rush through the process. Be sure and set aside enough time to, to make it high quality for sure. Yeah, I always let it sit for at least 24 hours before yeah. coming back and editing it. And yeah. yeah, if I can leave it alone for a week or longer, that's even better. Yeah. All right. Well, tell everybody, how can they reach out and get a hold of you at uh, AV Riding Services? Who is your uh, typical client you like to work with? What can you do for them? And then, of course, how can they reach out and get a hold of you? Yeah. So typical client is any small business owner who's looking to increase their online presence, whether they're not blogging or and they know they need to be or if they uh, are blogging and not seeing results from it. Those are the people that I can help. So again, my company is AV Writing Services. It's really easy to find me. I'm at AV Writing Services everywhere. My website is avwritingservices.com. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, my YouTube channel is actually under my name, Allison Berhalen. So you can okay. find my videos there. All right. Yeah. And I'll be sure and include all those in the show notes as well. So again, thank you so much for your time. Certainly appreciated. That's going to do it for another episode of the Business of Business podcast. Uh, of course, you can find us at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. We're on all the major uh, podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Spotify. If we're not on one that you listen to, reach out. I'd be glad to add it to help you listen easier. We're also on all the major social media platforms. Probably hang out on Instagram a little bit more. Be sure and reach out and engage with us over there. A video of this interview will go up on our YouTube channel when the episode goes live, so you can look at it over there as well. So until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business. Mm -hmm.